No matter how dark things seem to be Jeremiah 33.3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Join us now to hear great and mighty things that have happened in the lives of people who have been changed through our Lord Jesus as they share their testimonies of how God answers prayer. Hi, I'm Pastor Mark Wall. I'd like to welcome you to another opportunity to watch God Answers Prayer. God Answers Prayer is an amazing show that's been on the air since 1984. And we've been seeing God Answer Prayer not only through this show, but through the lives of people that watch this show. If you've had something happen to where you saw God answer a prayer based upon something that you saw here and a prayer that was prayed for you here, please, we want to know about that. We also want to encourage you to call our prayer line at 505-345-4165. There are people standing by to pray with you, and they would love that opportunity. On today's show, we're going to have a gentleman named Dennis Curtis. And Dennis uh, also gave us a scripture that he really loves. And so we're going to go ahead and read that. We're going to read John uh, chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. We're going to enjoy having Dennis with us, and he'll be with us right after we come back. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a real treat today. On today's episode of God Answers Prayer, we've got Dennis Curtis with us, and he's going to give us his testimony today. Dennis, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, sir. Appreciate it. So um, I, I was kind of reading some of the information that you sent in, mm -hmm. but I don't think it really gives us a true picture until we hear it out of you. Okay. So if you would, share with us your testimony and how you came to know the Lord. Okay. Well, uh, let me start. Uh, I was born in Socorro, New Mexico. I was raised in Almogordo, and uh, I had probably a nominal American 
uh, upbringing. Uh, my parents weren't Christians, and I didn't have much Christian influence, except for my maternal grandmother. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a Christian. Uh, she was a faithful Catholic, but she had a faith in Christ. And I could tell the difference between her and my other grandparents mm -hmm. and, and even my parents and uh, the people around me. I uh, went to church one time when I was in fourth grade, and I remember crawling under the pew and waiting there, and I was spending the night with a guy named Curtis, his first name was Curtis, and I was under the pew, and I remember his mom telling me, get up, get up, but uh, something was affecting me there. Um, but I didn't have much, um, I went to Catholic Church a few times, I never really had an influence working with me. Mm -hmm. My uh, younger brother used to read the Bible at night and tell me, you need to read this thing. And I remember thinking very specifically, ah, that's not for me. Right. I don't have time for something like that. Um, so I grew up, I graduated from high school, and uh, I started experiencing sin <laughs> and the pleasures of sin. Um, I, as soon as I graduated from high school, I moved out of my parents' house. I started doing my own thing, and I really fell into a rut, a place where I was not happy, and uh, the pleasures of sin was my focus. And I really went after that. Uh, I moved in with one guy and he moved out. And I moved in with some other people and they kicked me out. And I moved in with some other people, they kicked me out. And I was uh, beginning to be a real mess. Oh my goodness. So one night I was uh, living with this guy. Um, I was in my room. I always slept through the nights. And I woke up, it was like two o'clock in the morning, and I woke up wide awake, and somebody was in my room. And uh, I looked around, but I couldn't see that person, but I knew somebody was there. And I kept looking, I thought, oh, maybe it's my grandfather, uh, because he had recently died. But all of a sudden, I started thinking about doing something that I'd never thought about doing before, and that was joining the Navy it came to me and I made a decision in less than five minutes to join the Navy and I went back to sleep. Now, I believe that was a ministering angel. It came into my room, told me what to do. I decided to follow that. I went to the recruiter, the Navy recruiter soon thereafter. And um, I told him, you know, I wanna join the Navy. He gave me a little booklet, said, you know, you can pick from one of these jobs and take your test and do all this stuff. And I found what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a construction electrician. And when I took it back to him, he said, well, you're qualified for that, but you have to enter the delayed enlistment program in high school in order to get that. And I said, well, that's what I want, so I'll have to wait two years, he said. Well, two weeks later, the guy calls me up and he says, if you can leave right away, then I can get you in that job. Wow. And boom, I was gone. It was wonderful. I went to boot camp. I saw guys crying in boot camp, wanting to go back uh, to their home. They'd miss their parents. And I was like, this is wonderful. I cleaned up my life. I wasn't doing the things I was doing before. I ate three square meals a day. I weighed 135 pounds. And when I went into boot camp, uh, when I came out, I weighed 30 pounds heavier and wow. I grew two inches because I had food, I had rest, and I had a purpose. Right. I wanted to do something. And it was one of the most wonderful times in my life. Um, I, wa I wasn't a Christian, still had no Christian influence. I went to one service there in boot camp, didn't mean anything to me. I saw all these people you know, praising God, and, and I was like, what are you guys doing? I just wanted to get out of right. the, the discipline of boot camp and, and go to this church. but. Um, anyway, I, I finished my boot camp. I went to school in San Diego, California. I went to another school in Gulfport, Mississippi. And I was really happy with my life because I'd cleaned up all my life. I wasn't doing the same sins that I was right. doing before, and I felt free and, and motivated. I went to my first duty station, Edsel, Scotland, uh, Northeast Scotland. And uh, when I got there, the guys that I was going to work for and the people that were there over me just brought me right back into that sinful 
way of life. In fact, it was worse. Mm -hmm. And um, they introduced me to all kinds of new things, new ways to sin, <laughs> new people to sin with. Yeah. And <clears throat> at first it was okay, but I didn't want to live that way. Right. And I started going downhill. I got worse and worse until I was like uh, just pressed down with my sin. And God started convicting me. It was in August of 1979. I remember it very well. Uh, I was playing around with uh, one of my friends. We'd been drinking and doing things that we shouldn't do. And I grabbed his hat and I ran as fast as I could. And I stepped into a tree well and at the same time he hit me, tackled me and broke my leg. Mm -hmm. I kind of went into shock. I walked back over to the car. I leaned over this. It was a red convertible Camaro. I leaned over it and I said, I'm no longer like Jesus. I have no idea where that came from. But somehow I knew that Jesus had never broken a bone and now I had broken a bone. Mm. So that's when God really started convicting me. I started feeling this void in my life, an emptiness, and I knew I was going to die. Wow. And it seemed like it was going to be really close. And this fear of death and this void of this emptiness when I died started really bothering me. So I started giving up my sins. I said, well, you know, I quit this, I quit that, I tried to not do this. I even told one of my close friends, and I didn't know this consciously, but unconsciously it came out of me. I was sitting on the steps and, and uh, this young lady was next to me and I told her, I said, God is telling me I'm doing things wrong. But I didn't know that consciously, but that's what was happening in my heart. So I tried to give up all my sins and um, get on with life. My brother was getting married back in New Mexico and I said, that's what I need. I need to go back home. I'm a New Mexican. I need to go see my family. Right. When I got back here, everybody was dying too. <laughs> I could see that. Nobody right. had life in them. And you know, we partied and, and we had these celebrations and I said, this is not life. So I went back to Scotland and I said, I need to get on with my own life. But the conviction of this sin and death pressed and pressed on me so hard that one night I went into my little flat in Breek in Scotland. I laid down, it was cold. I left my coat on, I left my shoes on. I was like so convicted, depressed, fearful of death. And I laid down and I said, oh God, help me. And I went to sleep. I woke up. Uh, at 11 o'clock and the BBC news uh, channel, the TV channel was going off the air and there was a guy holding a Bible. You could see Holy Bible there and he said, all God wants is good. And then the TV went off the air and I sit there and I started thinking if it's good for God, it's got to be good for me. So I want, I want to do this with God. And God started showing me my sins very clearly. He said, you know, what about this sin? And I said, I'll give that up if I can go with you. Right. And then another one came. I said, I'll give that up if I can go with you. Another one came and I had plenty. And I said, it doesn't matter. Whatever it takes, I will give it up if I can go with you. And right then, something changed inside of me, a complete change. The fear of death was gone. The void of death was gone. The conviction of death was gone. I had this life inside of me and I jumped up and I said, I'm with God. I was reaching my hands to the heavens. I was jumping up and down saying, I'm with God, Amen. I'm with God. And I turned on some music, which I couldn't listen to for months because somehow it just, uh, didn't fit with me. I started <laughs> dancing around. I was so happy. I opened uh, this little Gideon Bible that I got um, in boot camp and I started reading it. And as I read it, I thought, now I know what I want to do with my life. Right. I want to serve God. And I closed that Bible up. I went up into my little uh, second stairs uh, bedroom there and I laid down. If this is real, when I wake up in the morning, it'll be the same. And it did. So um, 
go back a couple of years, <clears throat> and I was transferring from uh, Gulfport, Mississippi to Scotland. I went into a transient barracks, and there was two guys in there, and one of them was a guy named Roland Logan, and a dear friend, but at that time I didn't know him, and he walked up to me with a Bible open, and he said, do you believe in God? And I said, yeah, I believe in God. He says, do you believe in the Bible? And I said, yeah, I believe in the Bible. And then I said, hey man, I'm gonna go chase some chicks and I'm gonna get drunk, do you wanna go with me? And he said, yeah, let's go. And I thought right then, well, his belief in God is no different than mine. And I pushed it aside. So back up, I had gone through this experience with the Lord, I was in Scotland and Roland Logan had moved to Scotland wow. and so when I had this experience I knew he was a guy with a Bible so I went to him and I, I told him I know this is funny but this is all I knew I told him Roland let's get religious let's go to church let's read the Bible let's do it all and Roland looked at me and he said are you sure, dude? What's wrong with you? And I said, I want to do this. I want to be a religious man. I want to go with God now. Right. And Roland didn't want anything to do with me because I would lead him down the road of sin. So he stayed away from me, but I came to him and he took me to church and come to find out there was this whole bunch of people in this church that kind of had the same experience that I did. Right. They were praising God and they were reading their Bible and th this guy was getting up there and talking about Jesus. And I said, man, I'm in heaven now because all these people are God people and that's where I am now. So I remember Chaplain Winslow was the guy's name. He was 62 or 63 years old back then. He's since gone to be with the Lord. He's a wonderful man. He was an Assembly of God minister and he was a naval chaplain. And he was teaching us and there was a little revival that went on because a lot of people were getting saved in that very small community. And I remember he brought me in one day and uh, into his office and he said, you know, a man has to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. I said, that happened to me. I know exactly what that is. Right. And I told him what happened to me. And uh, that's where I learned you had to be born again. That's, I was born again. Right. My whole life changed in an instant. I gave up all that sin and all that uh, fear of death. It was all gone and now I knew I was God with God and I knew eternity was inside of me. Amen. So uh, later on, this is a, a period of four or five months, he told me uh, about being water baptized. And uh, I said, yeah, I'll get water baptized. You know, it's in the Bible and Jesus did that, so I'm gonna do it. So he took me down to Dundee, Scotland, me and a few other people. And I remember there was a gospel choir there, uh, a black gospel choir, which I had joined for a while and they were singing these uh, old black gospel songs about God's gonna trouble the water and Elijah come and it had this soul music and they were up singing and I walked down into the baptistry and, and I got water baptized and I came out and I knew that God was working in my life. Um, and then later on, he, he called me over uh, into his office. And I can remember this. I can remember his office. I can remember his desk, his face. It's just like yesterday. And he said, do you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? And I said, you mean there's more to God than what I have now? <laughs> and he said, well, kind of, yeah. But, you know, I want you to go. And I, I told him right then, whatever it is, I'll take it. Let's right. do it. And he said, hold on, hold on. He says, I want you to read through the book of Acts and learn about what this filling of the Holy Spirit is and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I said, okay, honestly, I didn't read it. But uh, weeks later, he took me to a full gospel businessmen's meeting in Dundee, Scotland. It was a large room of people. There was quite a few people in there and we ate dinner and there were some pe people who spoke and then they said, if you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, come on up here. And so me and two of my buddies were there and they put these chairs kind of in the middle of everybody and Chaplain Winslow and his wife, who I knew quite well because we always went over to their house for dinner and stuff, 
Well, they came around us with a few other people and they put their hands on us and I'd never experienced that before. Mm -hmm. But I knew Chaplain Winslow well and I knew his wife and I trusted them. And uh, I didn't know what it was at the time, but they started speaking in tongues mm -hmm. and placing their hands upon me. And the power of God came on me like I had never experienced before. It was so powerful. I could barely sit in my seat. I was bent over and weeping. Mm -hmm. and, and my two friends next to me here, the same kind of thing was happening to them. And I felt like I was in the very presence of God. There was like this power around me and pressing in and cleaning me out. And my two buddies next to me, they, uh, they stood up and they started raising their hands and they began speaking in tongues. And I'm looking at them and I'm going, what is going on here? You know, this is really different. Uh, but I knew I was with God and that night I went home and uh, I was a little disappointed because I didn't get what they got, right. you know. And I uh, went home, went to bed, and uh, there was three of us in the house at the time. Roland, I ac actually moved in with Roland Logan. He and I got this apartment. It was a little flat outside of Breek in Scotland and a uh, small little place. And there was another guy who uh, months before I met him in church, uh, Dave Largent, he was a mature Christian and God told him to move in with Roland and I. And uh, I remember he came to us and he says, hey, I, I wanna move in with you guys. I wanna move out of the barracks. And Roland and I said, there's no room in that little flat right. for you, right? And um, he said, well, you know, I want to move in with you guys. And Roland and I talked separately and we said, you know something? We're Christians now and we got to love God's people. So, okay, Dave, you can move in. Right. And that poor guy, he sl slept on the floor on like a futon, had his clothes and stuff stacked up because it was a small place in my room. So he was sleeping there uh, that night and I was in my bed and the morning I got up and Dave uh, was in his futon there and he got up and he goes, Dennis, you got it, you got it. And I'm going, Dave, what did I get? And he goes, last night you sat up in your bed, you started speaking in tongues. <laughs> I said, me? I said, I don't remember anything about right. that. And he goes, you did and oh, God's wow. doing it in your sleep. Wow. So time went on. David Largent was quite a blessing. He really taught us uh, about music. He taught us about worship. He taught us, God brought him in there and he taught Roland and I all kinds of stuff. And to this day, it was wonderful. He was a blessing oh, to us. God. So, Anyway, so uh, I moved on from Scotland. I got stationed uh, back. I went to Gulfport, Mississippi, and then I got uh, transferred to Guam. This was about a month and a half transition period. And uh, wonderful church there in Guam, wonderful people. I want you to hold off on the story about the church in Guam okay. until we take a break. But sure. brother, I'm telling you, this is powerful because I too was also in the military. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're the last show that I did, the guy was in the military. Mm -hmm. and I don't know, God's kind of hitting me with all these guys that were in the military. Ladies and gentlemen, I pray that this has been a blessing so far. And we are going to continue with Dennis's testimony and let him share with you some of the things that God has done with him around the world because God has been so amazing and Dennis has seen God move in ways that we can only talk about because we weren't there. And we pray that you'll call somebody who needs to tune in and see and hear Dennis's amazing testimony. Thank you. We'll be back right after this.
On God Answers Prayer today, our guest is Dennis Curtis, and Dennis, it's amazing. So you you went straight from uh, Scotland to Guam, or did you go back to the States for a little while? I went back to the States to Gulfport, Mississippi. Okay. I was a construction electrician in the Seabees. Right. And uh, so Gulfport is one of the home ports, and then I deployed to a place called Guam. Okay. Yeah. Well, tell us. Keep on going, brother. All right. Tell us what happened. So I, I went to Guam, um, <clears throat> and there was a wonderful church there in a Gat, Guam. It was a, a place of nourishment. There was actually, he was a retired uh, military. He was a Air Force uh, E-7. He had retired and become a pastor there. And it wasn't a big church, but it was a very good church. And uh, they welcomed the military people right in there. So we really in, uh, enjoyed that church. Uh, just a real quick thought of there was a missionary that came through there that was doing some preaching and uh, he was uh, um, he was very short he was a midget uh, and um, so he had a car accident and in that car accident it, it ripped all of his guts out they were all mm. over the the ground and um, they put the, his guts back in him and took him to the hospital for him to die and he tells his testimony i don't remember his name but it was quite the testimony Anyway, God told him, he said, I've called you to be a missionary. And he said, he said, I can't do it. I'm, I'm just about dead. And he, he said, I've called you to be a missionary. I'm going to heal you. And he says, I will only be a missionary if you grow me up because I don't want to be this short and be a uh, missionary. And if you saw the guy, he was like a, a, a I hate to say midget because it sounds bad, but he was a midget from here up, but his legs were like this long. And so he looked kind of odd and he had this, I thought he was a female the first time I talked to him because he had this really uh, small voice. But God put this guy back together, grew him up, and he was a missionary in the Philippines and he came and told all the miracles that God was doing, <laughs> healing people in the, in the Philippines. And, and the demons, he was casting out demons out of these uh, Filipinos and the church was growing. It was just a tremendous uh, ministry. That's the kind of stuff that I was hearing there in Guam. So um, one night I went behind the barracks. It was like a, a grassy field and not very nice grass, but I went back there and I told God, I said, I'm gonna stay right here until I start speaking in tongues. I'm gonna pray. If it takes all night, that's okay. And within one minute, I was speaking in tongues. I had this new prayer language coming out of me and um, I didn't wanna stop. I wanted to keep doing it. There was a lot of guys there uh, that were born again, Christians, who uh, did not believe in this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And one was a guy from, uh, I remember uh, Steve was his first name. I uh, can't remember his last name right now, but he was really against this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, but he was a Bible guy and he read through the Bible and I used to tell him, you know, read this and read that, read Acts. And I remember one night he came knocking on my door, bang, bang, bang. He, I opened the door, it was late at night, and he stood there, we were face to face like that, and he starts speaking in tongues right in front of me. <laughs> and uh, he, I said, you got the gift of speaking in tongues. And he said, Dennis, I could not deny it any longer. I read through the Bible. The Bible is my book, and I'm going to believe whatever the Bible says, not what everybody tells me. Right. And uh, so we had that kind of thing going on in Guam. It was uh, absolutely wonderful. So I went back to Gulfport, Mississippi after my time in Guam, and I went to another place, Diego Garcia. Um, and I'll just mention that real quick. Diego Garcia was a small island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, a mm -hmm. uh, very small place. Only men were on the island. And uh, me and a couple of other guys were evangelizing the people around us. And I remember there's two Catholic guys there. One was Tom Osmock, uh, became a good friend of mine. But we would talk to him about the Lord and about his Catholic faith and about being born again. And I remember one day, um, I read it in the Bible that a man had to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And Tom was looking at his Bible and he goes, the Bible's the word of God. And if that's what it takes, then that's what I'm going to do. He shut the Bible and he said, I want to be born again. 
And this guy, to this day, he's still living for the Lord. He's working for a church up in Pennsylvania, wow. walking with the Lord. But he was set on believing the Bible, and that's what converted him. Amen. We saw a lot of guys uh, get saved there. We saw a lot of neat things going on. Tom burnt uh, on the beach. He burnt all of his music, his cassette tapes. And I remember there were uh, unbelievers coming to me telling me, what is Tom doing? He's got to stop this stuff. He was one of us. Now he's not. He's a Christian now. And he's burning this stuff. And he's talking about Jesus. And you made him do this. And I said, I didn't make him do this. This is Jesus <laughs> making him do this. Yeah. Um, so we had a lot of good testimonies there in Diego. But then I went back to Gulfport, Mississippi after that deployment. And we were, all the believers were going, most of us were going to this little church called uh, the Lighthouse in Gulfport, Mississippi, in North Gulfport. It's a small church, it wasn't very big, but it was a spiritual church. And we really grew there. We learned about uh, washing feet, we learned about prophecy, and um, we saw healings, we saw the presence of God quite often. And I remember there was a guy there and he said, I just went to a revival out in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Mm. And uh, this guy prophesied over me and it was so right. So Tom Osmock and myself, we said, hey, we're gonna go to Pascagoula to see this revival. Right. And we were excited. Uh, we got there and it had rained and it was a tent revival, big tent and it rained and it was soggy in there and they directed us to this little church. So we went into that little church and it was packed with people in there. People in the middle of the aisle, standing room on the other side and the, the uh, minister, Drew, Drew Roos was his name. Um, I remember him as kind of a red-headed young man. Uh, he was older than I was at the time and he was praying for people and he prayed for Tom, Tom went up for prayer, and he prayed for Tom, and when he prayed for Tom, Tom fell out on the ground. I said, what in the world's going on here? He started praying for other people. Boom, the whole place started laying people out. Right. And I'm going, whoa, God's in this place, you know? I had never seen that quite like that before, so I was a little taken back. And he asked, anybody else want prayer? So I said, well, I want prayer, I'm gonna go up there. And I remember Drew looking me in the eyes and he said, Dennis, he said, I'm not talking to you, but I'm talking the fear that's in you. And he, he told that fear to leave me. And that fear came out. I, I could feel fear leave me. And then God filled me afresh. I felt the love of God come on me. I remember reaching up to the sky saying, I'm done with life. I want to be with God. I was, reach, I was on my tiptoes with my hands in the air saying, I'm ready to be with you, ready to be with you. The love of God was poured out on me. And uh, the guys, it, it was kind of funny, but the next guy next to Drew gave me a big hug. And uh, when he hugged me, he said, the love of God is all over this guy. And he passed me to the next elder. <laughs> and that guy gave me a hug. And I'm, all that time, I was with my hands in the air saying, Lord, I want to be with you now. I was satisfied with my life. I wanted to be with God because I felt this love that I'd never felt like right. this before. So Drew came up to me. He looked me in the eye and he says, God's given me one word for you, Dennis. And I said, one word. And he said, teacher. And that's all he said. And that resonated inside of me. Now, I wanted to be a prophet. That was what was in my mind. But God called me to be a teacher. And that's exactly what God did with me through the years. I've been with the Lord 43 years. Amen. And shortly after that, I started teaching Bible studies. And every place that I would go after that, I was in the military for 24 years. Every place I would go, I would teach children's church. I would uh, teach Bible studies, adult Bible studies, youth Bible studies. Every place I'd go, God used me as a teacher. And there was always an open door for me, teacher. Uh, even I did a little bit of worship leading, but in that I was teaching people how to worship. Amen. And so that's what God has used me for is teaching. 
And now through COVID, uh, I was teaching a Bible study at work prior to COVID, and I was teaching at a, one of the local churches here, uh, men's Bible study. And then COVID hit, you know, that changed everything. And I remember the Lord asking me, uh, I wasn't doing any teaching during that time because of COVID. And I remember the Lord prompting me to start a podcast. And I said, honestly, I said, I bought a microphone, I sat down and I tried. And it was so bad. I took the microphone, I took it back and I turned off all the stuff. And I said, there's no way I can do the podcast. I'm done. And about a year later, the Lord said, Dennis, will you help me teach my people? I heard that voice very clearly. I said, okay. You know, I, I don't think I can do a podcast. Right. I, I just don't have that ability. I was able to preach pretty good. I was an assistant pastor in, I later went to Scotland in the 90s as a duty station and I was assistant pastor there for a while. And I could preach okay, but the podcast sounded terrible. And I didn't want to do it. But when he asked me to do that, I said, okay, Lord, right. I'm going to do it. So I went and I got the gear and I got all the stuff and I put these um, um, soundproofing things in my little office there and I started doing it. Right. And so I've got about 40 podcasts out. Uh, I think there's 40. Um, and it's called The Clean Soul. And it's on Apple, it's on Google, uh, Stitcher, it's on Stitcher. Uh, and it's also on the internet at thecleansoul.org. Okay. So if anybody wants to listen to these teachings, they're there. Um, but uh, so that's what God's used me for is to be a teacher. Amen. Yeah. What an amazing testimony, brother. And now you were in the military for 24 years. 24 years. Yeah. And how long ago did you get out? In 2003, I retired. OK. Yep. And then I, I came to Albuquerque with my family. Um, I came here because I wanted to get a job in either Colorado Springs mm -hmm. or in Austin, Texas. And my brother was in Albuquerque and he had internet, uh, fast internet, because I was in Minnesota with my wife's uh, mother and there was hardly any internet up there. So I came right. down here to search for a job and I got a job locally and I didn't want to stay in Albuquerque, but that's where God wanted us. We're, I was trying to get a job somewhere else, and um, so I got a job here, and uh, needless to say, I've been here for another 20 years. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but this is where God has us, and it was uh, good for my young family at the time. They all, you know, got jobs and went through mm -hmm. college and school and stuff here. Um, so, uh, just a side note uh, of my wife, uh, when we, we got pregnant uh, when, uh, in 1984, we went to Iceland uh, in the military. We were both in the military and we uh, had our first child there. She got out of the military to raise our children. And uh, she, actually I decided in the beginning, after we left uh, Iceland, we went to Gulfport, Mississippi. This is a different time. And um, our son was getting old enough for uh, school. Mm -hmm. And right across the street from us were two principals. One was uh, a principal in Biloxi, Mississippi, and the other one was a, a vice principal in Gulfport. And they had their child in a parochial school, in a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. And he was the, uh, the, the man of the house, was the vice principal of the school that my son would have gone to. And I asked him, I said, why in the world don't you have your girl in your school? And he said, there's no way I put my girl in that school. Oh my. It's, it's not a good place. And uh, so that really got my attention. I said, what am I gonna do? I have this little boy, he's gotta go to school. We were going to a church there and there was a couple, they had five children and we got to know them pretty well, but their children were different. And they would look me in the eye, mm -hmm. they would call me Mr. Curtis, and they were all the same, very respectful, very articulate. Mm -hmm. They were, they could sit in church, all five of them would sit in church where, you know, ours wouldn't quite sit in church. Right. And uh, so we went to their house 
they uh, lived in this small trailer house and in the back they had desks and they homeschooled and mm. that's the first time we ever heard of homeschooling right and I remember telling my wife we're gonna homeschool <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at first she said uh, no we're not we didn't really know what we were right. doing but she uh, heard the Lord and the Lord called her to homeschool so she homeschooled our three children from kindergarten through high school wow and uh, so all of them are, um, you know, doing well mm -hmm. financially, spiritually. Some of them are, are doing uh, good. Some of them need a little bit of help uh, along the way. So um, just a little plug to homeschooling. We, we did, she did that for 24 years. And of course, I was supportive of that. Uh, had to be supportive to, to make our house uh, do well. Amen. So, yeah. Amen. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, I pray that this testimony has meant as much to you as it has to me. We're not finished yet. If you have somebody who needs to hear the rest of Dennis's testimony, have them call them, have them tune in, say, hey, there's a guy on God Answers Prayer right now that you need to hear. And God knows exactly what he's doing and who needs to hear this next segment and what he's going to talk about. We do give God all the praise, honor, and glory for carrying us through those things that we don't want to give up necessarily, but then the Lord transitions us and transforms us. The Bible says that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. And what an awesome thing to take on the mind of Christ instead of continuing with the mind of self. This is going to be the most powerful segment yet. Call somebody, get them to tune in. Remember our prayer lines are open. You can call 505-345-4165. Our prayer partners are standing by and ready to pray with you. All you have to do is give us a call. We want to pray with you. I thank you so much for what you're about to hear and for calling somebody and telling them to tune in. We'll be back right after this. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to continue the interview that we have with Dennis Curtis today here on God Answers Prayer. Dennis, brother, you've touched my heart because a lot of this and being in the military is near and dear to me. The thing that didn't happen to me is I didn't get filled with the Holy Ghost until I was already out of the military. So I, I also had a Gideon's Pocket Testament, and that was how I became a Christian in 1992 at 2.30 in the morning in billeting in England, in Upper Hayford, England. Yeah. yeah. So keep pouring it on, brother. Keep sharing with us. Okay. <clears throat> I was just thinking, uh, before I left Scotland back in 19, uh, let's see, it was in 1980. Uh, before I left, I uh, felt like God was calling me to be a missionary in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I kind of set my heart to do that. Uh, I went through, um, I went back to Gulfport, Guam that I talked about, and I got out of the service for a short time. And I said, God's called me to be a missionary in Scotland. So I got out of the service 
and I uh, picked up my bags and I went to Scotland. Wow. And I found uh, a place there that was uh, a missionary training place. It, it was in uh, Peter, Peterhead, Scotland, which was north of Aberdeen. And I was excited to go there. I had money and I had time and I had put everything behind me because I felt like God called me to Scotland. So I got up there and I could tell some things were not just jiving quite right. Mm -hmm. And I called the people at the school and they said, yeah, you can come up. And they didn't seem to be very organized and it started bothering me a little bit. I was in Aberdeen uh, waiting for the school to start and I was going to an Assembly of God church there. It was a British Assembly of God, no connection to the American Assembly of, of God. And it was a beautiful, big granite church pretty small uh, congregation and there was an older gentleman in there, a uh, Scottish man, and he would preach, good preaching, and then he would prophesy from time to time. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in there and saying, you know, uh, how do you prophesy? And so he taught me a little bit. He could see that I was kind of disjointed uh, and needed to grow a little bit in Christ. And I said, you know, sometimes I feel like God wants me to say stuff. Right. And I remember very carefully his counsel. He said, if, if you feel like God's going to tell you something or going to speak through you, don't say a word. And I said, really? He said, you wait until you know it's God speaking Amen. before you speak. And that's always stuck with me. Anyway, I uh, was going to go to that um, missionary training. And I remember that pastor told me, he, he, he prophesied over me, and he told me, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it blew me away. I was, I was devastated because I got out of the military. I'd taken all my uh, money for education, and I was going up here, but I knew in my heart that he was right. So I traveled back to the United States, and uh, went to my hometown, Alamogordo, and I started working there. I worked in a, uh, at a church doing maintenance work, and I was a children's minister there. I was teaching the children there. And I remember working one day, we were laying cinder blocks, and uh, I said, God, something's wrong, something's wrong. And he told me very clearly, it was a hot day in the summer in Alamogordo. We were on a construction site, and he said, I never called you out of the military. And wow. I was again taken back. I missed God. Mm -hmm. And it really shook me up. So needless to say, I went back to uh, the a recruiter that was there. This was six or seven years after I'd went in the first time. Right. And that man worked furiously to get me back in. He said, I want to make sure you get back in right away. And within just a few weeks, God called me back or got me back in the service. And um, so I met my wife uh, in, there in San Diego, California. We got married, we went to Scotland. But 10 years after I left Scotland the first time, I got orders back to Scotland. Wow. And God took me back there. I missed his timing. I heard his call. Mm -hmm. But I missed his timing. It was a 10-year wait for me to get back to the wow. place. And that's where we really, uh, that's where I was an assistant pastor at a church. That When I, we got there, it was a little Scottish church. It was a very small church. There was about 10 or 12 people there. And when I got there, that church grew to about 80 people. The pastor was able to go full time and I was his assistant pastor. A lot of Americans were going to this Scottish church and it grew and it blossomed and they bought their own building and uh, it was a real move of God that I was able to enjoy. And that's what God had called me to some 10 years before. But I had to wait for his timing. I had to mature and grow in the Lord. Um, I'll say a, a little testimony that when we were there, we were in uh, the church one night. It was an old uh, block building and um, old church. It was built in 1912, if I remember right. Cold, no insulation, the walls were stone, uh, but it was a church and that's where we were at. And we were having a prayer meeting in there. There was a Scottish guys and there was an American guys all around us. And this guy walked in and he's drunk. 
He's very drunk. And he comes stumbling in the church, banging the doors open. And I don't remember exactly what he said, but he said something like, you guys believe in God? And we were all, yeah, we believe in God. And he said, can I bring my dog in here? I said, yeah, bring your dog in. Come on in here. What do you need? And we wanted to minister to right. this guy. And he was, he was drunk. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't believe in God and I don't believe in this stuff. And we said, well, we do. And if you want to meet Christ, we can introduce you to him right now. And he said, he sat down and he says, I don't believe it. And we all laid his hands on him, all of us, all the way around us. And the power of God hit this guy so hard, like punched him onto the floor. And he jumped up and he was saying, what are you guys doing to me? What is this? I feel something on me. What's going on? And it was the power of God on this guy. And he sobered up. He said, I'm sober now. What did you guys do to me? And we were able to minister to this guy. We got him into a rehab, alcohol rehab. We took care of his dog for quite a while too. But the power of God, we saw the power of God minister to this guy came in there. He was destitute. He lost his family. He lost his kids. He told us he just uh, uh, sold the hearth over his fireplace for booze and there was nothing else in his house. He had sold everything. Mm. And God wanted to touch that man. And I'm telling you, we were all just amazed right. that God did that to this man. Um, that's uh, one of the testimonies. Um, you got time for another one? Oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So um, we were, uh, this is before we moved into the church, uh, a young man came in and one of the, uh, there was like three of us that were pastors in, in, in that place. One of them was a young man. He was quite a bit younger than me. Sean was his name. And he was a powerful young Christian and loved that guy. He's a great guy. Anyway, uh, one of his friends came in and said that uh, he was oppressed by an evil spirit. And he knew it and he knew how he got it. I think it was playing Dungeons and Dragons or something like that. And he got this evil spirit inside of him. And he said, it's killing me and I got to get it out. And Sean, I remember Sean, he's quite a bit taller than me. He stood up and he pointed at that guy and he said, get on your knees. And so the guy got on his knees and he said, confess Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. And that, when he said that, that guy jumped up in a roar and he came after Sean like, like a monster. Wow. And so at that time, you know, me and I remember this other Scottish guy who was a pretty big guy. It took all three of us to wrestle this guy to the ground. And then we started casting that demon out, telling that spirit to come out of him. And it took a couple of minutes, but then all of a sudden the guy just went limp. Mm -hmm. It was done. And he just laid there. It's like he was dead. There was no movement in him. And uh, during that time, uh, my wife told me later that there was another guy in the church uh, who was, uh, he was an alcoholic, but he wasn't the same guy I talked about earlier. And he picked up a chair and he was gonna hit Sean and I with a chair, this wooden chair similar to this one here. And my wife walked over there, took his hand and said, they're doing something good. He said, no, they're gonna hurt that guy. He said, no, they're doing something good. And he walked him away. So credits out to my wife oh, for saving yes. us because if he would have hit us with that chair, it would have been really bad. But that guy was delivered. I don't know how he did after that, but God set that man free. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was an experience that I didn't quite uh, have before right. that I experienced there to see the power of God and the Bible coming to life right in front of us. Mm. Yeah. When you start dealing with people who are possessed and mm -hmm. see God remove demons, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, um, the apostles were exactly instructed to go and do that. That's right. And somewhere we've kind of lost our way mm -hmm. and forgotten that we have authority. Yes. And, yes. and the Bible is pretty clear about how much authority we have. Mm -hmm. And many people stay away from it because they're afraid of the unknown. Right. Yeah. And you know, it's a war. 
and it's a spiritual war, as you know, Ephesians uh, 5 tells us. We're in a spiritual war, and we can't see in the Spirit, but the war is there. And so we have to pay attention to the Word of God and understand how God operates and the authority He's given us and the position He's given us and the purity that He's given us and so that we can fight this spiritual fight right. and be victorious in it. Uh, because if we don't fight in the spiritual realm, when we fight in the flesh realm, in you know the person realm and in the mind realm, mm -hmm. we're not gonna have the power and the authority that God's given us in the spiritual realm. Right. So it's very important. I talk about that in one of my podcasts about the war that we're in. In fact, I think I did three podcasts because there's so much to it. Even in the Old Testament, we see how Satan was working mm -hmm. to try and destroy the way of God and the people of God. Right. Same thing today. God wants to set us free, fill us with His Spirit, and then bring us into that war so that we can bring other people in to Christ for eternity. Oh, amen. Yeah. I'll tell you, it's uh, refreshing to to hear somebody who's uh, been dealing with spiritual warfare the way it's supposed to be dealt with. And the, uh, it, it's not about religion, it's about a relationship. It is. And it sounds like, brother, your relationship is intact. Oh yeah. Yes, I, sir. I've been walking with the Lord for uh, 43 years. I remember 1979, just before the, the new year, we were all, it was a big party and I wasn't saved at the time, and everybody jumped up for bringing in 1980. And I sat there and I thought, I'm gonna die, and there's no hope in this world. Right. And God got me 1980, that year, just a few months later, He showed me what hope is. Amen. And um, I wouldn't turn away from it. No. Nope. I tell you, you've been a positive influence today, and, and you, I know that your testimony is going to go out, and there are going to be people that will probably even send you a text or an email or something to share with you how your testimony has impacted them. And when that happens, brother, let us know, because okay. we look forward to hearing about that. The uh, I, I want to pray for you before we sure. go. Okay? You bet. Uh -huh. Father, right now, I lift my brother up to you. And, and Lord, I ask that you continue to bless his ministry, continue to influence every word that comes out of his mouth in order to advance the kingdom of God. And Lord, I ask you to let those that are hearing hear exactly what thus saith the Lord and not what Dennis is saying, but what you're saying through him. Lord, I thank you for the walk that he has, and I thank you for the souls that have been won through Dennis. And Father, just keep pouring on the blessing so that he is able to continue to minister in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Brother, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh. It's it, been my pleasure. Oh, it's been awesome opportunity for me mm -hmm. to be able to sit with another former military man and know that God is moving in that person's life. It is powerful. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you got as much from this opportunity to hear Dennis's testimony as I did. I pray that if you have somebody who uh, needs to talk to Dennis or to find out more about his testimony, have them contact him because there are so many people out there, especially, in, and for me it's near and dear to my heart, veterans that need to hear that other veterans have come to Christ and are able to, to see changes come about in their life. Too often we carry around those things that people put labels on like PTSD and things like that. And God is the answer. Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is the answer. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching Dennis uh, give his testimony. This is God Answers Prayer. And we appreciate you. And until next time, may God bless you and keep you.